Could we find our way back home if we were suddenly transported to another part of the galaxy? Would people born on Mars grow taller to adapt to lower gravity? Can you jump off the surface of Pluto? And in our free bonus question on Patreon, what would happen if dark energy is disproved? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers as always wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Balash Suhajda. Hey Fraser, if we somehow accidentally got teleported to a random location in our galaxy, what would be the easiest way to find our way back home to Earth? So that's a terrific question. And when you think about it, it's actually really difficult. Think about the most powerful mapping spacecraft that has ever been built, and that's Gaia. And Gaia is mapping this sphere around the Earth or was mapping now that it's wrapped up its mission. And it was measuring about uh, 2 billion stars in the galaxy measuring their position. And then for many of those, it was also measuring their velocity, but that position. But it's very accurate, very close to the Earth. And then like much less accurate when it's getting closer and closer to the center of the Milky Way, and it's only really seeing the brightest stars. And so, you know, unless like if, it was, if you randomly teleported around the Milky Way, the chances are you wouldn't find like if you're on the other side of the Milky Way, you're not able to see through the center of the Milky Way, you kind of wouldn't know where you are. But if you are in the same side of the Milky Way, then there are some things that you could use and that and the most effective thing that we know of is the pulsars. And that's where we've got these neutron stars that are rapidly rotating, they're dead stars that just went through a supernova. And they're putting out these regular pulses of radiation. And each one is unique. So, uh, you know, some are giving off their pulses 700 times a second, others are giving off their pulses 30 times a second. And so you could look around you and find the locations of all of these pulsars and you would just check against your database and then you would go, okay, I know where we are. And in fact, people have proposed this. You know, there was the, the nicer instrument on board the International Space Station. This is a instrument designed to measure the x-rays that are coming from various pulsars. But people have been able to test out this pulsar timing and that you could say track the space station was able to track its position in orbit around the Earth, not using GPS, but in using the signals that were coming from pulsars. And so you could, you know, as long as you were able to see enough pulsars, you would know ex and you had a good map and someone had had the wherewithal to give you the map of the pulsars, then you would probably know exactly where you were. And then you're able to find your way back home, assuming you had a spacecraft that would take you, you know, faster than the speed of light to get home. Adam Redwine, if you were standing on the surface of Pluto, could you jump high enough to reach the Barry Center? The escape velocity of Pluto is 1.2 kilometers per second, 1200 meters per second. That is as fast as a sniper bullet. So if you can jump as fast as a bullet, uh, then you would be able to uh, jump up to the Barry Center of off of Pluto. But the reality like, like people think that like being on the moon, the gravity is so low that you might be able to accidentally jump off and, and go into orbit. And on the moon, the uh, the escape velocity is like more than two uh, kilometers per second. And so it's one sixth, the escape velocity of Earth, one sixth Earth's gravity. And so you just take whatever amount you can jump, right? Uh, and you multiply that by six, that's how far you can jump on the moon. And so maybe on Pluto, you multiply that by 10. Whatever you can jump, you can jump 10 times as high on Pluto, which would be exciting. Like that would be crazy, be super weird. You know, every step you take, you're jumping 10 meters high, that would be neat. If you could jump a meter, um, but you're not jumping into space. Average hummus, would people born on the moon or Mars grow taller? You know, it depends on which generation. I think if you experience a lower amount of gravity, you're definitely going to have less bone mass, you're going to have less muscle mass, you know, we don't know, let's assume that it's safe, that it's healthy, that you have less bone mass, you have less muscle mass, but it's fine. But you're still going to be limited by the gene expression passed along by your parents. So you're going to be whatever height you were, you would be even if you were on Earth, uh, you're just going to have 
less bone mass and mu less muscle mass. So you'll be a lot um, skinnier, right? Um, but if you know, evolutionary processes continue, and you no longer have the force of gravity that's pulling you down, then subsequent generations are going to have people grow taller if there's some evolutionary advantage for them to to doing that. So you can absolutely see 1000s of years down the road, millions of years, I say millions of years down the road, uh, you could see humans who are who are a lot taller in a place with lower gravity. Now I say every week that we do the live stream on Mondays at 5pm. But I understand that doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes you have to watch it after the fact. And if you don't want to watch the entire two hour episode, and you know, it's gonna be overlap, and you're gonna watch the question shows, you can watch it all in three pieces. There's the two question shows that we release every week. And then there is the rest. And we call that overtime. And over on Patreon, for all the patrons, you can get access to a special video version of overtime, which has all of the remaining material that was in the live show, but with other B roll and videos and graphics and stuff overlaid on top of that. And this is done by Anton. I don't know how he finds the time to do this, but it's awesome. All right, so you can go and find all that go to patreon.com slash universe today. And thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Sean Sargent, F, Dr. George M. Cornicelli, Peter J. Kushar, Richard Romerman, and Mark Levesque. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Darth X zero, wouldn't it be better to aim for a sustained expansion into space rather than a race? Well, of course, um, that you know, we don't see a gross domestic product race. Uh, we don't see a economic race, we just see countries continuing to grow continuing their productivity gains and increasing the standard of livings for the people who live in those countries. And the reason you got a race was the same reason that you got a race to get to the top of Mount Everest. It was hard, it was expensive, and it required the ingenuity of an entire nation to be able to pull off this incredible feat of landing on the moon. And the same thing is going to be required if everybody wants to land on Mars. So what do you get for that? Well, you get the bragging rights. We were the first people the first person to land on the moon was and then in this case, it was Americans uh, could have been the Soviets, although they had problems with their with their rocket. But the first person to land on Mars is question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know who the nationality, we don't know what is the nation that was capable of mounting an effort to land a person on Mars. I mean, there's a lot of viable options, you've got the Chinese, you've got the US, you've got a private company like SpaceX, maybe you've got a collaboration with some combination of those. And then one of those people happens to be the person who actually sets foot on on Mars. So so those races are like that first time to try and do a thing, but that the races aren't sustainable. And we saw that because, you know, people set foot on the moon back in, you know, late 60s, early 70s, 50 years ago, and they haven't gone back. And that's because it was incredibly expensive. And, and there was no profit, no, no value to be gained from setting foot on the moon. We see lots of space flight, we see tons of satellites, we see communication satellites, weather satellites, you know, we're using space, but still, there's no reason to go to the moon apart from because it's what's next. It's the place that's farther. It's the place that brings out the best of humanity to be able to accomplish a goal that big and Mars will be the same thing, which is actually going to Mars and setting foot on Mars will demonstrate that we have this incredible ability. But it, you know, you know, I think a, a lot of people misunderstand how expensive this is and how little money there is to be made from this. there's essentially no business model at all. And so, you know, if you go to Mars, you have to be okay with going to Mars, and it just costing 10s of billions of dollars a year in your ongoing operations, hundreds of billions of dollars to be able to pull this off. Now, human beings have demonstrated they're willing to spend 
that kind of money when there's a profit to be gained. When you know, you know that you're going to do offshore oil drilling, you know, you're going to spend billions of dollars to explore areas and find new oil. And you're going to build these enormous structures and you're going to harvest oil and you're going to sell that and you're going to make your profit back. Then people are willing to make those kinds of investments, but that just doesn't exist out there in space. And so right now we're still in the, the only reason to do it is to demonstrate that you can because when you know, let's say let's say that a, a person from China is the first person to set foot on Mars, then that demonstrates to the rest of the world or China hopes that that demonstrates to the rest of the world that they are a technological superpower that they had the ability they got to Mars first before anybody else. And that that shows, you know, that's like brand building. Um, but you don't make any money for being second. And you definitely don't make money from just going back and forth and back and forth until later on, way down the road, we get this buildup of infrastructure across the solar system where finally then there's money to be made. But that's going to take as long as it takes. And we kind of can't rush it that the economy of Earth needs to grow outside the boundaries of planet Earth to a point where starting to harvest these resources from space to use them in space starts to make sense. And that will just happen, you know, all on its own, or like with the hard work of people and the investment of people and people taking big risks and so on. But it won't be because, you know, there was a race. So they're two completely separate things. Matij Hunka. What are your thoughts on mining the asteroids and minerals on terrestrial worlds? Should any regulations be in place? It's an interesting question. And I think like just in general, there should be regulations. I mean, you are potentially bringing home material from another place in the solar system, there should be regulations if you're going to attempt to, to bring that material back to Earth at tens of kilometers per second, have it impact the Earth's atmosphere. But then like the deeper question is just who owns this stuff? I mean, the Outer Space Treaty says that no nation on Earth is allowed to claim ownership over anything in the solar system or in the universe, really, that you can't claim it. And so you can't claim an asteroid. That said, I think there's a lot of regulations that are in the works by the US and other countries that say, well, but you can extract resources from those places. And I think that's legitimate, especially if you're going to try to use that to extend your presence out in space. But like what regulations like really is like, don't make this stuff hit Earth, I think are the main regulations. Um, I can't think of any other big regulations that would need to be considered. Like maybe my imagination is, is pretty limited. Um, you know, I think that there are aesthetic concerns, wilderness concerns about our future acquisition of material in the solar system that, you know, maybe down the road, we're going to start strip mining Mars, we're gonna start strip mining the moon, we'll start strip mining Mercury, as we produce more energy, require more resources, we're trying to build our Dyson sphere, and we start to dismantle these places. And I think that there is a certain value to a place like Mars, this pristine environment like Mars, this pristine environment like the moon, like Europa or Enceladus, all of these places. And then in fact, it's the asteroids, the little rocks that are flying around in the solar system that are, I think, less requiring protection than these other worlds. And I would be fine that if okay, we can extract the resources from the asteroids from the comets from the stuff that's just randomly jumbled around. But we want to have regulations in place for the places that are more like a wilderness that are entire planets where we want future generations to go to Mars and still be able to experience Olympus Mons, you will experience the largest deepest valley in the solar system. When you think about these special places in the solar system, those are the areas that I think we need to have more regulation and more concern. And that the price will probably have to pay is that then the asteroids and the comets, which have like a higher density of, of more valuable elements anyway, they are the thing that we sacrifice. Did you know that you can watch the same video for free with no ads over on Patreon and get a bonus question as well. And this week's bonus question is what would happen if dark energy was disproved. So go watch the version on Patreon. I'll put a link in the show notes as well as in my comments, maybe a card here somewhere. I'll put it in your dreams. Patreon.com slash universe today.
All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank everyone for watching. Now, once again, we record the show every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world. But I know that's very random. So I'll have a link to the next upcoming event here on the channel. Now I'm going to show you another thing from the shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Brian Body. Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, Sean Sargent, James Clark, Barry Lake Roofing, David Matz, Jim Burke, Stephen Fowler Munley, Paul Robach, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiblin, Spiderswap.io, David Gilton and Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Abe Kingston, Michael Purcell, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, so, so what's on the shelf? Uh, so this week I've got magic cards three magic cards. Now these are alpha magic cards, which are the first editions of magic. And they are signed by the artist of these three cards. We've got two from Anson Maddox and one from Mark Tidine. And this is personal for me because I was able to play Magic the Gathering at a prototype version uh, back, I, I remember when it started, 1997? 96, maybe before that, 91, I don't really remember anymore. Um, I went to Gen Con and I was friends with the people from the Wizards of the Coast. And they asked if I wanted a ride in their van that they were renting to be able to go to Gen Con, which is a gaming convention in Wisconsin. And um, on board was a bunch of the artists from Wizards of the Coast. And so I became really good friends with them. And they showed me the prototype for this game, Magic the Gathering, except it was cards with photocopies of like Garfield and other stuff. And we played the game and I like it was so much fun. And I knew that it was going to be a huge hit. And so I was able to get a lot of magic cards early on, which I since sold a long time ago. Um, but I kept three. Uh, and these are sort of three cards that remind me of that trip that I took with the people from the Wizards of the Coast when I first learned how to play Magic the Gathering. All right, we'll see you next time.